You are listening to the Tri Order Transmissions Episode 41. And now, here are Craig and Jeff. Tricorder Transmissions is back again with our 41st episode. As always, we are your hosts, Jeff Hewlett. And Craig Cohen. And this week, we're going to be talking about the deadly years. Yeah, I guess you could say a a well-known season two episode. Yeah, you know, I think this episode fills a certain niche in the original series. I think just about every series of television that's ever been produced in American TV ever in the history of ever has done an episode where people had to get dressed up in old makeup. (laughs) Yeah. I I just think that's just a de facto. You have to do that at some point. Even if you do like 5,000 seasons, there has to be one episode where people get dressed up as old people. Yeah. I guess it's a a storytelling device. You're, you're eventually going to hit. You might as well, right? It's out there. Yeah. Yeah. So 41 episodes we are in. Go figure. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty exciting. But if you want to get on the ground floor with us, we've actually just started participating in another podcast. Yeah, and let me tell you, I am ecstatic. Yeah. <laughs> I am really excited about this and and you know, I I've been waiting all my life to get involved in in a musical discussion that is right in my as much as I hate this word wheelhouse, it's in my wheelhouse. Yeah, so um, back in the Mirror Mirror supplemental log episode, we had podcast host Ken Mills on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And during that discussion, we actually talked about the Monkees, who you're a huge fan of. Oh, gigantic, gigantic. And um, through that episode, Ken learned um, that we all had a mutual sort of love of the Monkees. And he told us he was putting this episode together, and based on... Our work here on the Tricorder Transmissions, um, he thought we might be a good fit for the show. So uh, at at this point, we have episode zero up, which um, I know was a lot of fun, and it and it's an excellent episode. It's got um, some interview clips, some great music clips, and then, of course, us sort of telling our monkey's story. Yeah. Listen, you know, I hopefully – We'll be reaching some people in the Trek audience who are also Monkees fans because if you think about it, Trek and the Monkees kind of almost happened at the same time. Yeah. So hopefully, people who were around at that time or uh, who experienced the late '80s Monkees resurgence or listening to this show will discover this podcast that we're on. I think this is going to be something really special. Uh, episode zero was a lot of fun to record with Ken and Craig, and uh, we had another guest, Chris, on, who were awesome. And I I think that I was listening back to it today, actually, and it's a really great journey through four different guys' experiences with the monkeys and, you know, who are our favorite monkeys and what are our favorite albums, and we're kind of just setting up this journey that we're about to go on. Yeah, and and it's really cool for me, too, because I'm, uh, out of the four of us, I'm probably the most casual fan so um being able to sort of really do a a, a monkey's deep dive is, is kind of neat for me and let me uh, throw out the name of the show it is called zilch and you can find it over at zilch and i'm sure we'll include that in the show notes yeah it's on itunes too yes isn't it? it's yeah, like yeah. zilch a monkey's podcast yeah, if you oh, okay. actually just search Zilch, it, it'll it'll come up. Nice. Um, but yeah, a lot of fun, and I know that's gonna be that's gonna be monthly. Mm-hmm. And we also have another monthly podcast that we do that <laughs> we, we do. We've mentioned on this show a handful of times, but we might as well talk about that as well. Yeah, while we're here, let's let's give a shout out to our other podcast, which is called Slycast. That is Craig and I and another Jeff by the name of Jeff Ferry. Who has been on this show before. He was on the... Way back. Yeah, arena? The arena extended yeah. episode talking about the Gorn. 
and All Things Arena. And the three of us got along well, and we decided we were going to embark on a new podcast mission together. We've got four episodes out already of Slycast, which is a Sylvester Stallone fan podcast. And we talk through and celebrate Sylvester Stallone's movie career. Yeah, and it's it's really neat. Um, the, the response has been uh, amazing. Incredible. And, um, you know, we realized after we launched that we're the only folks that were doing a show like that. Other movie podcasts had devoted an episode to, you know, maybe the Rocky films or the Rambo films. But what we're doing here is we started in 1970, and we're chronologically, for the most part, going through his career. So we're talking about movies like Fist, Death Race 2000, um, Nighthawks. Paradise upcoming, Alley. Yeah, Paradise Alley. Upcoming, we're going to be talking about Rhinestone. So we're hitting the movies that nobody else really talks mm-hmm. about. And we're talking uh, about them um, as fans of Stallone. You know, some of those movie podcasts, they like to sort of run movies down. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. um, but it, like you said, it's a celebration. Um, and we all, you know, really, you know, love and admire the movies of Sylvester Stallone. And uh, I think one thing uh, people could learn from from that podcast is is how many great movies he has, Absolutely. you know, outside of the Rocky and Rambo franchise. Yeah. So. So it's kind of neat. So if you enjoy hearing me and Jeff talk, um, <laughs> those are some other listening to this. Yeah, those are some other podcasts you can hear the two of us together on. And uh, I know I've really enjoyed all of the podcasting that I've done, and uh, and uh, this show, along with with all the other ones I'm involved with, and all the ones I've been a guest on, uh, are really really fun. And and Ken Mills actually uh, made a really good analogy way back on Podcast once, where he he mentioned that. Podcasts are basically like the fanzines of the digital age. True. Absolutely. This is this is new media, quote unquote new media, where anybody who has a computer and a microphone can get their opinion out. Yeah. It's it's a fantastic medium. I I have enjoyed every minute I've spent doing this so far. And I think it's just, it's a fantastic way for fans of anything, music movies television shows to just get their their opinions out there to talk things through and and have some fun doing it and maybe some other people can listen in and enjoy as well yeah yeah i know that anytime i watch a movie or a tv show that i really really enjoy one of the first things i do when i'm done is go to google type the name of that show or movie or even song and then put podcast next to it (laughs) (laughs) and nine times out of ten i'm gonna find a podcast that talked about that movie tv show album band i you know i just watched or listened to so it it really is amazing and uh it's really great um to have you know have this kind of outlet and uh and you know and and have a you know the ability to to interact you know with other other fans too it's it's really neat absolutely except in the case of slycast where it seems there inexplicably there were no other sylvester stallone podcasts out there yeah I, i don't know if 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 a lot of people just thought it was too daunting of a task or there were people that just didn't think to do it, um, but but we uh, we came up with a with a with a unique approach and uh, and uh, it's when it's all said and done, it's going to play like a uh, multi part audio documentary of Sylvester's entire career. Yeah, and, and judging by the first four episodes we have out, I think it's going to be a really great ride going oh, all yeah. the way through to the other end. It's you know by the time we get there, we'll have the Expendables three. And I'm sure he'll have one or two more films out by the time we get to the end. So there's going to be a huge amount of material to talk through. Yeah, and we get pretty, um, as Jeff Ferry said, long-winded on that show. We definitely The First Blood and First Blood Part 2 episode uh, clocks in at two and a half hours. Yep. (laughs) Well, and deservedly so. Both of those films are great in their own right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we are discussing them uh, with a level of detail that gets pretty... You know, we put a microscope on those films. And, yeah, uh, we really do. And I, yeah. you know, I'll I'll apologize to our Star Trek related audience if this intro has been a little too tangential <laughs> to what we normally talk about. But we we normally don't self promote our other shows. But uh, we've we've met with a lot of great feedback over the last few weeks with these other couple of shows we've been involved in, and we just figured that if anybody out there who's listening to us as the Tricorder Transmissions has any similar interest with the Monkees or Stallone, it would be a beneficial thing to mention these two shows. So forgive us for self-promoting. <laughs> yeah, we we won't go down that road too often, no. but uh, 
if, if you're here um, after 41 episodes or just joining us for your first episode, um, hopefully you enjoy hearing us talk. So uh, hearing us talk about other things might uh, might be something that, uh, you know, is is sort of up your alley and, and could help you uh, maybe pass the time if you're uh, during your commute or whatever else. Yeah, uh, and speaking of listening to us talk, we've got a good 40 to 50 minutes of commentary to get started with for yeah. the Deadly Years. So the Deadly Years aired on December 1st of 1967, and we've got a remaster that aired on January 6th of 2007. Yeah, and I have a little bit from the NBC press release that was issued on November 13th. Captain Kirk loses command of the Enterprise when he takes a landing party to a planet to check the progress of a scientific experiment and exposes all of them to a disease in the deadly years on NBC television network Star Trek color cast Friday, December 8th. I'm just going to repeat the word color cast because <laughs> I really like that word. Oh, it's great. It needs to come back. Yeah. All right, so we are going to get started with our scene-specific commentary on the color cast of the Deadly Years in 3, 2, 1. The Deadly so, Years begins with yeah, no flyby. I was just going to say that. It's just a, a beam down. Yeah, and, you know, I think you will recognize a similar set in the third season— uh, I, I'm not sure the name of the episode off the top of my head, but um, it's the one where McCoy, I think McCoy gets sick in some way. Okay. But this looks very similar to that episode. Uh, really interesting looking orange backdrop sky there. Yeah, it's almost like a creamsicle. Yeah, and and I want I want everybody to notice that in the background here, there's something that's very rare in the original series, and that is. A female with short hair. <laughs> yes. Keep an eye on that. And she, she's not wearing a red shirt. Yeah. She's wearing and, a blue shirt. And you'd expect Chekhov to be wearing a red shirt here because he's doing the red shirt's job here. Yeah, he really is. <laughs> and what a giant wussy. Can, and even Walter Koenig himself uh, in an interview uh, later on after this episode remarked on how much of a wussy he had to play in this particular scene. He yeah, wasn't happy it, with it. Yeah, and it, it all it really is there for is to set up right. the resolution of the episode. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's funny when you think about it. When you're watching, I guess if you were watching this cold uh, without us or without any experience, you would you would just accept that for what it was. But you'll find out later on that's that's the the resolution of the episode. But you know the thing that really kind of bugs me about the fact that Chekhov is here, and this has bugged me in the past, but is that Sulu is still up on the Enterprise. You're going to see Sulu in a little bit. And here's Chekhov in the landing party getting preferential treatment Yeah. to Sulu, who has been a series regular for a long time. I just, I feel bad for George. Maybe George said, I'm not going to play a wimp. Per perhaps. But if, if, uh, if you listen to our, our last episode that came out last Sunday and listen all the way through to the end, you would have heard a clip of George Takai talking about his rivalry with <laughs> Walter Koenig. So uh, if you yeah. didn't listen to that, go back and, and take a listen. Uh, excellent. Yeah. So we, we see a couple of really old people here. Yeah, which is odd because Spock had just indicated when they found this uh, uh, old man who had died of natural causes, he said there's nobody here over the age of 30. And then these two people walk in. Right. And he is 29 and she's 27. And let me just tell you, let me just say that I think that this stinger is super lame. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love the original series, but this stinger, I mean, you've seen fantastic stingers in the past. I just think this stinger, an old guy saying he's 29 yeah, is not something that I'm like, <gasps> you know, in the series of stingers that we've seen, this is not the best in my opinion. Yeah, no, I I would have to I would have to agree. Yeah, but this is another Pevney episode. Yeah, he was on quite a roll. This is the third uh, episode in a row directed, or at least in terms of um, air date order, um, directed by Pevney. So, uh, yeah, so we've got uh, a but, big time recurring director going. Yeah, on. not written by DC Fontana. This episode no. was written by 
um, David P. Harmon, who's who we're going to see more Trek from. We're going to see him. He also wrote a piece of the action. Oh, another good one. And the animated series episode, The Eye of the Beholder. Oh, awesome. Now, I want you to really quick, as a watcher, pay attention to this. You're going to you're seeing right now an extremely what I think is an extremely long orbital flyby in the uh, remastered episode. This is going on for quite a while. Yeah. Now, and watch how slowly the ship progresses into space here. Yeah, but I'll tell you, this was one of those shots where I almost re, you know, reversed it and watched it again. Because it was great. The detail on the ship there and the the weight you, you sort of it's you know it's not 3d of course but you see the weight of the ship mm-hmm. and oh, i've absolutely. been um more and more impressed with um the less sort of flashy details of the the remastering you know it's one thing to to redo uh you know a, a flashy special effect but you know something as simple as the enterprise flying um the amount of detail that probably went into that um i, I can't imagine how many days somebody might have worked on that no, I agree, and I think it's it speaks to the tastefulness of the remasters that they did to this show, and and the fact that they were so they fit in so seamlessly in in ninety nine percent. Yeah, I mean, there's the, been yeah, there's been very few times where I've sort of cringed. Yeah, so we're finding ourselves in a briefing room here, and I, I thought it was kind of interesting that you have two unknown characters who are in this briefing room and kirk says that that gamma hydra 4 this planet sector falls within their area of administrative duty <laughs> where have we heard that before has any have we ever heard that uh, that 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 certain starfleet personnel are responsible for areas of space yeah no it's and once again this is not where no man's gone before. Yeah. <laughs> People have been here already. Come on, man. Yeah. Uh, right. I think this is an underutilized um, sort of uh, area of the Enterprise. Uh, this Oh, the briefing room? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you don't see it too, too much. Yeah, I think it's awesome. Uh, you know, just the idea. Um, it's very similar to what our area looks like when we have our supplemental discussions. Right, right, right. Absolutely. And you know, you know, something else that doesn't make a lot of sense in this episode, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if you picked up on this or not, but we're seeing for a very, again, rarely, we're seeing a Commodore who outranks Kirk, but this Commodore, as opposed to Commodore Decker, this Commodore is wearing a red shirt. Yeah, he's and he's basically got no stroke, like, right. Um, in terms of the i guess the chain of command in terms of um i guess he's not like um he's more administrative right yeah, yeah he's, he's like a pencil pusher right we're gonna find out more about him in, in as the episode goes on he has no combat experience but once again here's another captain kirk trope he stays behind to talk to this female who we find is someone from his past Yet again, another quote unquote old friend of Kirk. But the thing that's kind of creepy about her is that she can recite by memory the amount of time it's been since she has seen Kirk. And she says it's six years, four months, and an odd number of days. Yeah. Now, Who bro, does that? <laughs> Kirk, bro, run. Yeah, that's a little alert you go off in your head. Yeah, bro, run. <laughs> <laughs> just just get out of there, man. Not a good idea. Yeah, I mean, who does that? You say, oh, I probably haven't seen them in six years, or I haven't seen them in eight years, or I haven't seen them in, in four months. Yeah, but she knows pretty much down to the wire how long it's been since she's seen Kirk, which is a little bit freaky. A mm-hmm. uh, little little plot point here, though, that, that just passed by. Spock is in, uh, investigating a rogue comet which they believe may be responsible for this rapid aging disease that they've experienced down on this planet. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it um, bears mentioning to the audience out there. So that's what they're looking into. Yeah. And the Commodore, um, he wants to get to um, 
Starbase they're headed to. Yeah, Starbase 10. Now, I have a question. We hear about Starbases. Why don't we ever see any? We never see Starbases. We're always hearing about Starbase this and Starbase that. And this time, you know, he's talking, he wants to get to Starbase 10, and I've yet to see a Starbase. Yeah. Actually, can can you repeat that? I'm um I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> ah, um, nice. But we just had that crew member, uh, the short-haired woman, um, come to McCoy complaining um of hearing loss, and McCoy kind of yeah brushes it off. Yeah, he kind of dismisses her. He's like, yeah, oh no, you'll be fine. It's okay. Yeah. Not to worry. Mm-hmm. And now we're also starting to see lapses in Kirk's memory. Right, yeah, Kirk He's, is issuing orders multiple times, the same order duplicated. Yeah. And look at this shirtless William Shatner. Yeah, I guess. Ladies, take it in. <laughs> Wish April was here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, oof. Oh, uh, yeah, April. well, you knew that guy was going to croak. Yeah. Yeah, he was going to croak. And so the old guy from the planet croaked. And he said, and the 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 girl from the planet croaked before that. So uh, everybody from Gamma Hydra Four is now dead from yeah. old age. Yeah, and McCoy's starting to gray out a little bit, and Kirk's mm-hmm. got some some muscle pain, and still nobody is really uh, addressing the elephant in the room. No, they're not. But but I will <laughs> say one really cool thing about this episode that doesn't occur in a lot of other episodes, or 99% of other episodes, is McCoy does a lot of doctoring. Yeah. He is the doctor. This is a McCoy-heavy, doctor-heavy episode. So much happens in sickbay. There's so many examinations and experiments and things that go on in sickbay that I think this episode may outweigh all other original series episodes in uh, sickbay viewing. Yeah, you 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 might be right. Um, in terms of the amount of care administered in sick bay, definitely, it's insane. I, I when yeah. I was watching this uh, to to do some research for this episode, I I was um, I'm absolutely amazed at the amount of time we spend in sick bay. Yeah, maybe space seed con spent. We you know there's a right. lot of con scenes, but there isn't a lot of you know medical treatment being administered. No, but in this episode, oh wow, uh, look at Scotty, man. Yeah. Scotty is hit much harder and much faster than anybody else. Yeah. So Kirk has advanced arthritis, according to McCoy's examination, and Scotty is just plain old. Yeah. And later we learn that your metabolism has sort of uh, plays into um, how the aging yeah. process uh, affects you. And here's Chekhov unaffected. And Chekhov, I I, I want to know is Chekhov the only other crew member that got to use those uh those wall leg out uh, workout tools? Because so Kirk far. we've seen using them a couple times, yeah. but now I I don't know if we've seen anybody else using them. No. Hmm. Wow. Thirty. So they're appro- aging approximately thirty years for every day. Yeah, and then and then Spock follows that up uh, in a, in a in a little uh. Coming up shortly, and he says, we have about a week. <laughs> I, I'm not the greatest at math, but uh, maybe Spock's got a week, uh, uh, you know, doing that equation. But, um, you know, in two days, you're going to age 60 years. <laughs> yeah. And Kirk Spock, says he's 34 in this episode. So he does. And Spock also says, though, that uh, their mental state yeah. has considerably less time. Yeah. And Spock's uh, keenly aware. And I love um, Kirk's. Um, hairline here oh it's awesome and you know you'll you'll see kirk's hairline fluctuate yeah a little in this episode and the reason for that is william shatner during the filming of this episode did not want to appear quote unquote too old Ah. (laughs) so you'll notice as we go through this episode that shatner does not appear quite as old as his other counterparts on the ship. So he'll always appear slightly younger looking, even though he's getting old. Yeah. You know, there's, uh, you can see here that McCoy's already got um, something uh, prosthetics or, or heavy makeup on his, his cheeks. Uh, whereas Kirk for most of the episode 
um, his cheeks look as smooth as uh, they do um, normally. Exactly. And you'll notice that, you know, Kirk and uh, Scotty are, are going more gray and McCoy is going blonde slash emo. <laughs> yeah, he's got like the floppy, uh, the floppy hair going. The one thing that's interesting about the, this aging episode, you know, when you're watching it 45 plus years later is comparing how they age in the episode <laughs> yes. to how they aged in real life. And I'm not really sure that they, they got any of them right. No, you probably and, I mean, right. and it's hard to do because, yeah, absolutely. you know, actors aren't going to age, you know, the same way that normal people age. That's true. Uh, but, but at the same time, there'll be weight fluctuations, which here weight doesn't really factor in because, um, you know, they're, they're not, you know, they're not aging over a period of years. They're aging over a period of days. So, you know, the weight you might put on or the weight you might lose as you get mm -hmm. older um, isn't going to play. Uh, and we get uh, an ill-placed ill mirror here, which she points out. She does. Um, which, I mean, how often do you see a mirror in Star Trek? Very rarely. Yeah. And you know what else just happened? Speaking of Lieutenant Galway, who is the short-haired, uh, blue-uniformed girl— we just had an exchange of dialogue that went on for quite a while with Lieutenant Galway while she was completely off camera. Yeah. You had uh, McCoy and Kirk talking to her for, for several lines before they actually changed the camera to see Galway. So that, that had to be done for dramatic effect because uh, I would imagine they didn't want you to see how bad Lieutenant Galway had gotten. Yeah. So – that's something that we that's a plot device we don't see used in Star Trek that often. Usually the cuts between dialogue pieces are pretty immediate. Yeah. Uh, and this time it was deliberately you know changed in the way they normally do things. Yeah, and I wonder if that sort of Pevney um you know being really comfortable with his place mm -hmm. um you know in the captain's chair. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, and having done this enough times now where he was confident enough and empowered to sort of make those stylistic choices that might have fallen out of the normal, um, you know, decisions uh, that uh, some of the other directors were able to work work from, you know, style wise. Yeah, absolutely. And this particular scene we're seeing now with the uh, aging Kirk in the hallway uh, talking to his, uh, I guess his quote unquote ex-girlfriend, this scene has a, a burn <laughs> in it that just, wow, it resonates. It, it, it was such a cutting burn. So I guess in the history between the two of them, you know, they, they were together and then they split up and she went out and, uh, you know, she wound up meeting another man who turned out to be 26-ish uh, years older than her, who became her husband. And now she's sort of trying to rekindle things with Kirk now that he's been afflicted with this uh, virus or disease that makes him get older. And she's still kind of pursuing it in a way that I guess doesn't sit well with Kirk. And Kirk says... Uh, you know, she's kind of offering up this uh, companionship to him. And he says, what are you offering me, love or a going away present? <laughs> just wow. That, that, that is a, just a huge line. Yeah. And look at the way she's looking at him as he walks away like, wow. Yeah. He just kind of punched me in the face with words. <laughs> um, so this is great. You know, I really um, I really love Chekhov as a character. Really? This scene is, I, I guess, what you would consider trademark Chekhov humor. Yeah. And I think it works. I do. I, I mean, I really think that I know he was sort of, uh, you know, the story goes that he was added to the series to sort of appeal to that younger demographic. Um, um, but either way, um, if, if he was forced upon Roddenberry, um, you know, it's one of those things where you sort of make, you know, lemonade out of lemons you know what i mm -hmm. mean and um i think he really added a a, a cool um aspect uh, to the bridge and even up through all the movies i mean i love him in the voyage home you know the whole mm. the whole sequence where he's on that um that uh 
that uh, Wessel. Yeah, the Wessel. <laughs> Did you see just now that you get you just got a rare glimpse at a, a close up rare glimpse of the front of that device that Kirk is constantly signing? Yeah. It kind of looked like one of those uh the, those toys that I had as a kid where you would you would be able to write on it and then you'd pull up the plastic sheet and it would erase everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh I I hadn't seen really a good real uh, a good view of that device until this episode. Yeah. Um that's excellent. And now we find out that 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 thing we have I don't remember another episode prior to this where they say what that thing he's signing actually is and they just said it's a fuel consumption report. Yeah. He just grabs this thing from whatever random yeoman XYZ that happens to be carrying it and signs off on it and hands it back. And you always wonder, what the heck is he signing? Yeah. And now we find out that that was a fuel consumption report. I guess there's still some sort of regulatory requirement that he sign off on the amount of fuel that the ship has expended over a yeah. certain period of time. Yeah, because even last episode, we, we saw that they were trying to uh, swing a, a a mining agreement. Right, so there's all kinds of fuel-related things, I guess, that go on in this show. Now, this moment that we're seeing here is, I think, is very descriptive of Spock's uh, struggle between the Vulcan side and the human side mm -hmm. of his personality. So we just saw Kirk is obviously asleep in the captain's chair. He's being watched by this Commodore, you know, who we can tell is, is looking for a way to unseat Kirk from that chair. Yeah. And in comes Spock. Spock grabs a hold of Kirk's arm and wakes him up. And then Kirk says, oh, 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 I was just thinking. And Spock just totally plays it off. He doesn't call him out on it at all. Yeah. So now, now you know that the Vulcan side of Spock would have been completely logical and cold and called him out on it. Yeah. But now this, the human side of Spock is like, listen, this guy's my friend. I, I don't want to humiliate him or embarrass him. I know he's going through something. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's funny because this was probably the point in the episode where I started thinking to myself, okay, Spock's going to need to relieve Kirk of his duties mm. pretty soon. Um, and, of course, we'll learn in a couple of minutes why Spock doesn't really – um, you know, run that play, if you will. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, Nimoy does a tremendous job in this episode of, oh, yeah, like you said, um, you know, balancing, uh, you know, the human uh, versus Vulcan aspect of himself, but also dealing with the fact that he knows he's acutely aware, unlike Kirk, um, that his mental uh, capacity um, is slipping. Yeah, and no, and I, I, I'm going to say at the same time as Nimoy does a great ep uh, uh, performance in this episode, I think Shatner is incredible in this episode as old Captain Kirk. I don't I, I just watched this not long ago to research for this episode and I'm watching it again now with you. And I don't see a time where in my mind he's not old Captain Kirk. Yeah, he's just doing such a great job of selling himself as an old man, and and you know I, I don't know if this is a, a an across the board thing, but I know I've experienced this in my own life that you know I've met a lot of guys who were eight older, and they a lot of them have felt threatened by younger people or or become more defensive when people challenge them on things, and I'm seeing all of that played out here by Shatner in this old Captain Kirk role. And I think he does such a great job of selling it that there's there's no moment during this episode where you doubt that he's actually an old Captain Kirk. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's... It's that's phenomenal. A, it is. And uh, it, I guess it would have been better if the makeup had matched that performance. <laughs> yeah. Well, it does later, later. Yeah. Later, later, he actually gets into the really old looking makeup. For, for, for the most part of this episode, he still retains most of his youthful appearance with some hair effects. Yeah. While the other guys all like, you know, McCoy and Scotty both get super ancient, super fast. Yeah. And you know what I also thought was was interesting is um, nobody... Um, 
you know, balls as they get older uh, yeah. in, on this ship where you'd think, you know, you know, you know, normally as people age their their hair, you know, their hair thins out a little bit. But here, uh, you know, McCoy, he's holding strong with that. You know, his hair might even be stronger mm-hmm. than it is when he's when he was younger. Yeah. You know, Scotty, who looks older than all of them, yeah. doesn't lose any hair. Uh, Spock, of course, retains the same hairstyle and Kirk just kind of slicks back. Yeah. Some. But uh, yeah, no, nobody loses their hair. I think it was too expensive or nobody wanted to shave their heads. But, um, you know, this scene here is it kind of unsettles me a little bit. Yeah, well, this is the scene where Spock's explaining why he can't take command of the ship. Yeah. And, and you know, this this kind of wishy washy Commodore almost railroads Spock into uh, unseating Kirk. And that kind of doesn't sit well with me, but I mean, I guess we've seen this before. We've seen Kirk get usurped by a Commodore in the past, but uh, in a a slightly different way, albeit. But, uh, you know, Spock attempts to excuse himself from this conversation multiple times. Yeah. In an attempt to save his friend. And that, of course, kind of flies in the face of the Vulcan way. Yeah. Yeah. So the human side of Spock is is really showing through because you can see in his in Nimoy's face right now that there's emotion going on. Oh yeah, totally. I, I you know th- I think this episode really does a great job of illustrating the the conflict between the human and Vulcan sides of Spock. Yeah, yeah. And while we're talking about Spock in this episode, one thing that Nimoy did in this performance that I don't know if it was him. Um, sort of looking into a crystal ball, but if you listen to his voice as the episode progresses, um, it gets lower and raspier. Really? Um, and he talks almost like he talks in, you know, the 2009 J.J. Um, Abrams Star Trek, which oh, wow. I thought was very, very interesting. Oh, that's that's fantastic. I'm not sure that I picked up on that. Yeah. Wow. Or or even at, you know, towards the end of Wrath of Khan when he uh, when he's, you know, having that final interaction with Kirk. Right, right, right. Um, I, 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 I noticed, um, you know, the voice sounded very, very similar. It almost almost like a, a looping session from from here could have been used for that. So um, just something to look for. And now we have our first uh, death from the the uh, the, cr- the crew that beamed down. Yep. The poor short haired chick. Who I I guess I guess you can you can liken that to uh, I guess if you're a red shirt or a short haired female you're pretty much done because <laughs> we don't see any really sure that many short haired females you either have long hair or you have it done up yeah and she had it cut close so uh, I I guess that that entitled her to uh, a quick exit yeah yeah so now we're getting into yeah um the I, I guess the what do you, would you even call it? The, this was called the Extraordinary Competency <laughs> Hearing. Yes. Okay. Which is mandatory in Starfleet. It's mandatory. It's regulated if a captain is unfit physically and mentally for duty. Now, supposedly, the second in command, which would be Spock, yeah. is supposed to uh, initiate this hearing to, dis- to discover whether or not the rest of the uh, co- the core crew thinks that Kirk or their captain is fit to continue duty in his current uh, state of being. Yeah. You know, Spock was very resistant to uh, calling this scenario. And, uh, you know, that that speaks volumes to his friendship with Kirk, but his hand was kind of forced because he was, he had to comply with, with regulation. So, We've seen quite a few of these court martial type scenarios in Trek so far. Yeah, yeah, and I and I got to say this is sort of where um if the episode's going to le- lose me, this is where the episode loses really? me because um watching it now um after listening to you explain um the nuances in Kirk's performance, it, it makes me a, a little bit more eager to watch this sequence, but it really feels like all this sequence is doing is repeating information that we've already seen and we've already experienced as a viewer. It oh, it feels like it's padding. Man, you're gutting me here. You're <laughs> gutting me. 
I, no, I, but like I said, this, now I'm watching this scene with a different set of dude, eyes. The 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 performances by all of these actors throughout this scene, I think, are incredible. They're all selling the fact that they're reluctant to sell out their captain. You can see it in their faces, the way that they speak. You can look at the way Uhura is sitting in that chair with her arms crossed. Yeah. Look at the way that this this yeoman, this unnamed female yeoman, is going to stand up and try to uh, defend Captain Kirk to Spock during this Inquisition. I think that all of these characters and McCoy, let's not even get into McCoy because he's going to talk in a minute, but all of these characters are going to try to defend this man. Oh, sure. I think I... that's just, it's amazing. And they all do it in such a convincing way. Yeah. It, it still makes me question, um, you know, how this possibly could have been done just as effectively in maybe half the time. Um, I don't know. I, I think for me, I, I did not feel like I was dragging when I was watching this. I felt like it was almost like a CSI or a, a, a Law and Order episode. And I was – I've seen this episode many times, and every time I'm going through this scene, I'm – still on the edge of my seat wondering whether or not they're going to sell out Kirk. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't really feel like it drags as much as I, I guess that maybe you feel it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Like I said, maybe it's for me, it's, it's, we're sort of just re, you know, relearning information that we've already been, you know, shown. Um, we are, but maybe, uh, maybe we didn't pick up on all of it because not all of it was out in front of your face. Not all of it grabbed the hold of your your hair and shook your head. It was, uh, you know, the, especially like these things like this code two versus code three thing with Ohura. You know, it was it was out there, but maybe we didn't really pick up on how significant it was, or that it was going to be reused in order to hang Kirk. Yeah. So, and then and then ultimately save the day at the end of the episode. Exactly. I mean, I don't, I don't think this scene is as ex, uh, extraneous as as maybe uh, it it could come off. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is actually a well placed scene. Now we've seen the the trial, the quote unquote court martial, a trial used as a way to rehash information before, but I, I think in this scenario it's. It's done very tastefully, and it, it doesn't feel like it's too much of a retread to me. Yeah. Yeah, and this this part where McCoy is forced to testify against Kirk, you can see, I mean, I think DeForest Kelly does a spectacular job in selling the fact that he's telling the truth, but he's trying to spin it in a way that doesn't make Kirk look so bad. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I think that speaks volumes to how much McCoy uh, values his friendship with Kirk uh, as much as the other crew members who've testified before him, that they're all willing to stand up and almost perjure themselves. Yeah. Uh, to, to defend Captain Kirk. I, that's, that, that's incredible to me that all of them have such a bond with him. Even the Commodore, even the Commodore says how much he respects Captain Kirk. Yeah. So this is this is almost a it almost feels like a, a bitch session to tear up Captain Kirk and look how how well Shatner sells this he's sitting there kind of thinking to himself you can see it on his face that he's thinking you know McCoy wants to help me but he kind of can't he's bound by his duty bound by the regulations bound by the laws and he acknowledges that McCoy is trying his best to help him out. Yeah, but at the same time, Kirk's not even aware of the fact that he, you know, dropped the ball as many times as he did. Of course, I mean he's 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 an old dude now. Yeah. He's de defending himself, and Kirk's got that bullheadedness to him. We know that he's got it. Look at the look on his face. Yeah, he's shaking his head. He's kind of like, I'm perfectly capable of speaking my own defense. He's gonna get up. He's gonna hobble around the room, and we're gonna get the boilerplate Captain Kirk. Uh, pep talk slash you know defense of his actions that we've seen many times before but delivered as an old dude yeah and look at i mean poor ohura is sitting there and she wants to help him and she wants to correct him no matter how many uh slip-ups he makes 
it, and it's it's sad to see that Kirk is is going to be so bullheaded through this whole thing. But I think this performance is fantastic. Yeah, no, it it, it is a, a great performance. I and love it. Yeah. He wanted to see what the old crew of the Enterprise would look like. This is pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. And actually, we a little bit earlier, um, uh, maybe uh, 40, 50 seconds ago, we saw Scotty uh, very briefly. And is it me or does Scotty kind of look like an Andorian? He kind of did a little <laughs> bit. If you just stuck the the uh, the head the, the head little things on him. Yeah, he's got like the, the an Andorian wig on, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know what? Rolling back here a, a minute or two, just like uh, I, 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 gl- I didn't talk about it when it was happening, but I, I want to mention this because it's sort of a significant thing that you may not pick up on while watching this episode. While McCoy, uh, not McCoy, but while Spock is interrogating Uhura, he ha- he holds up a, a note and in, and says that Uhura. Uh, put her initials, plural, initials, on this document. Now, Uhura has never had a first name in the series or in the movie. She's always been Uhura. But yeah. now Spock says initials, plural, yeah, as if she signed a first and last name or a first and last initial. So is that a an admission that Uhura has a name that we don't know about? I think so, yeah, and, and didn't they finally reveal that name in uh into darkness yeah i don't count that but um <laughs> but uh, yeah i i don't i that that that, that mm, yeah it, i can't think that the jj anything that happens in the jj universe counts yeah. towards the original series or the movies yeah i mean i never assumed that uhura didn't have mm-hmm. um uh, uh you know an, another name it's kind of like spock we never really you know, you know what? We don't what? know his Vulcan name. Yeah, which is impossible to say, I guess. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we don't know that either. But uh, well, I, I wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, no, it's it definitely that that it is definitely uh, an interesting uh, observation, and uh, surprised after all the years uh, that they ran with the original crew that they did not give her that moment where um, her and maybe Scotty um, could have had one of those moments. Um, that they had in, in the uh, the films, mm. um, you know, where uh, she revealed her, her her full name. Well, let me tell you, if this show was made today, Ohura's first name would have been like a season cliffhanger. <laughs> you know, I, it just is an unfortunate side effect of the way TV is today. But I think that that would have been what a, what a quote unquote big reveal. Yeah, and you know what? The whole season they could have built up to it where you have moments where it's about to be revealed and then something happens. Yeah. Um, you know, Kirk could get frustrated that, you know, somebody walks in, uh, to, you know, onto the bridge at the moment where, you know, the reveal might come. And so we get this whole season long build and everybody's, you know, ready to fall off their seat and then they get yeah. to the cliffhanger. Oh, man. Totally. I, you read my <laughs> mind. You read my mind. Now, I, as much as I'd love to continue this conversation, this scene, I think this scene is so worthy of analysis because you're seeing this this side of Kirk that uh, it, it, it's, it's almost it's disturbing to me that he is going to be so paranoid in his old age and his almost senility. That he's gonna, he's gonna send Spock away and say he never wants to see him again. Yeah, he feels a, a huge sense of betrayal. Yeah, he's so paranoid. Uh, I just, I, again, I've said this already, and I'm gonna say it again now. I think Shatner does a spectacular job in this episode. It's so, I, I, it's amazing to me. Yeah, that he's able to take Captain Kirk and age him 40 years yeah, and be convincing enough that you think, wow, this is old Captain Kirk. Yeah. Get out. It's so well. And he's sending Spock away. I never want to have to look at you again and look at the look on Spock's face. Yeah. Wow. Could you imagine if I said to you, Craig, I never want to look at you again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
it's, you know what? And and we've talked about sort of. I think it was what um, the omelet episode of season one. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Operation Annihilate. Operation Annihilate. Yes, yeah. we, uh, and we talked about how that could have been a, a click a cliffhanger. Ooh. Um, this definitely feels like it could be. Um, if we go back with that analogy of being made in today's day and age, this feels like an episode that could have been at least a, 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 a two-parter that at least maybe the end of this spilled over into the start of another episode or a cliffhanger. Yeah, a where season it, ender. It ends with Kirk uh, aged out, yep. saying he never wants to see Spock again. And, you know, anytime a series can go to, a, you know, the end of the season and then make you wait an entire summer to, to find out, you know... Uh, you know, uh, what uh, Next Generation had the uh, luxury of doing that. They did it mm-hmm. with, what, the best of both worlds. Yep, they did. You know, which now, I'd, I'd imagine was an incredibly frustrating uh, couple months for, uh, uh, for there's Trek a fans. Huge, I, I, I could go into volumes about that. I, I've, read, I've read a ton and ton of interviews and articles about that cliffhanger. But I think coming up here in a little bit, there's an even better opportunity for a season-ending cliffhanger. Oh, yeah. Coming up. Where uh, you, you've got pretty much the height of tension of this entire episode, I think would have been a fantastic break to a second episode or a season ending cliffhanger. Yeah. Look how old Kirk looks now. Yeah. And, and, McC- and McCoy's pretty aged out, too. Yeah. He actually, the funny thing about that is that McCoy looks almost like his uh, his appearance in The Next Generation here. Oh, yeah. When he, uh Yeah. I yeah. wonder if that was by design, if uh, the makeup artist on uh, on Next Gen um, used this maybe episode as a reference point. Yeah, perhaps. But, well, a little little sneak peek behind the scenes note about this episode is that uh, they had oversized uniforms created. Yeah, so they looked, like, uh, smaller. Yeah, to make it look like they were shrinking Yeah, as no, they I, aged. Yeah. So here we go. Here we're getting the... Uh, the reasoning behind why Chekhov um, did not age. And it's basically uh, the theory is that uh, in his frightened state, um, he had a burst of adrenaline, Mm -hmm. uh, a heightened heart rate, and the fear basically made him immune to the, uh, the aging uh, effects that were caused by, I guess, this, this radiation. Yeah, a little bit on the ridiculous <laughs> side. And I think it's kind of funny that McCoy is able to recall this, I guess, quote-unquote, ancient remedy of adrenaline, Yeah, which has been outlawed for some <laughs> reason or another. Yeah. Early research. They're talking about they abandoned when hyrolinin hy- yeah. was discovered. So uh, adrenaline, which is a naturally occurring thing in the human body, is now outlawed? Yeah. Really, really weird. Really yeah. weird. So we got a, a cool montage, which mm-hmm. is uh, kind of rare in this series. It is. We don't see a lot of those cross-fading montages. Ah, and look at this Commodore Stockton sitting in the captain's chair. Commodore Stocker sitting yeah. in the captain's chair. Now, yeah. here is a prime example of freezing up oh. in the you, face of adversity. Man. Yeah. You know what? Um, if you ever thought that the guy at the start of Generations who Kirk has to score to sort of come in and save the day for, what, Cameron from Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Mm. <laughs> this guy makes uh, Cameron from Ferris Bueller's Day Off in uh, Generations look like um, – uh, highly decorated Starfleet captain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And this is what I was talking about when I said that we had a really good uh, opportunity for a cliffhanger. Yeah, this this gets about as tense as I can remember the series ever getting, and the payoff is 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 amazing. I love this ancient Captain Kirk trying to fight his way out of sick bay to get to the bridge because he knows that he can fix this situation. Yeah. And I think uh, Stoker is doing a good job here as well. This is actor uh, Charles Drake, who uh, died in 1994 at the age of 76. Mm. But I think he's doing a really good job of a guy who's completely over his head here. And he he has no idea what to do. Oh, absolutely. Uh, his face shows the whole story. Mm-hmm. So basically what his, his order was, 
was they were going to cut through what the neutral zone to get to their his star base. Yeah, what the hell was this guy thinking <laughs> yeah. as a commodore? Yeah. He is going to order a ship to fly directly through the Romulan neutral zone? Yeah. Dude. Yeah. You're crazy, man. <laughs> yeah. So uh Drake um had a pretty uh long career. He was active from 39 to 76. He uh was in um over 83 films between wow. 39 and 75. Um he did a mixture of dramas, comedy, science fiction, horror and film noir. And um, yeah, uh, he was also on several episodes of Wagon Train. So I guess that's our sort of Gene Roddenberry connection. Good old Wagon Train. <laughs> yeah. So now um, Kirk is volunteering to take the uh, experimental uh, concoction here that uh, he's being told it could kill him. And, and I like his line where he says, I'm dead anyway. Yep. Uh, he which is, is resolved. I mean, well, I mean, he's got a point. He's going to yeah. croak soon. Yeah. Now, I, this is the spot right here. Yeah. This uh, is the cliffhanger spot. They could have cut this off right now as the Romulan ships are firing and Kirk is convulsing yeah. as they get in the shot. This would have been the perfect spot to kill this episode yeah. and make us wait six, nine, 12 months yeah. for resolution. I love the underbelly of the Romulan ships there. Mm -hmm. um, where they faithfully recreated the very 60s the bird, style. Yeah. You know, it's like you'd almost see that on the side of like a conversion van. The conversion <laughs> van. Nice. <laughs> so this is, I mean, Sulu's basically delivering the news that um, the Romulans know their shields are going to give out. And, you know, Stoker says, let's surrender. And Chekhov matter of factly says Romulans do not accept surrender. Well, um, let me tell you, this scene, the, the the last couple of scenes reveal two major things about the Romulans. Now, we have two quotes, one from Uhura and one from Chekhov. One is the Romulans are, are notorious for not listening to explanations. And the other is, sir, the Romulans do not take captives. Yeah. We're learning about Romulans without... Oh, wait a minute. I'm just glossing over right now. I just want to bring this up as... Now, the young Captain Kirk has just walked onto the bridge, and Chekhov has this smile on yeah. his face. It's like, all right, you know what? We're done. We're fine. We are completely <laughs> yeah. fine. Kirk is back. He's going to get us out of this. Yeah, and I'll tell you, this was one of those moments where the payoff here is so great. This it's is amazing. one of those moments that has sort of you, you know, you sort of stand up and do like that Tiger Woods style, you know, fist, yeah. you know, um, you know, uh, you know, movement mm -hmm. um, because Kirk really takes everyone to school here. And it's such a simple um, solution. And we get a callback to the quarter mic maneuver. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, this in my in my mind now, uh, out of all the episodes we've seen and we've seen through Kirk do a lot of heroic things. But this to me is one of the best Kirk hero moments that we've seen so far. He comes on the bridge. He is oozing confidence. Yeah. He comes up with a solution immediately. He doesn't even have to think about it. He yeah. walks onto the bridge. He assesses what's going on. His crew has full confidence in him. He immediately employs the plan without even giving a crap yeah. what this Commodore has to say, and it works. Yeah, but the, the really cool thing about this is it was sort of – um, this whole ending is made possible by the mistake that old Kirk made, um, you know, forgetting that code two was a code that the Romulans had already cracked. Um, so they transmitted under code two. So without really, you know, having that pointed out, um, I'm not entirely sure this is a, a, you know, a solution that Kirk jumps to that quickly. I don't know. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on this one. Yeah, I, I think it was kind of cool that, you know, old, old Kirk and young Kirk sort of figured this out together. <laughs> yeah, well, see, there you go. That's Captain Kirk taking all of his faculties, yeah. everything available to him. And now look at how happy everybody is. How smart. And now we're going to get the the admission of guilt on the part of the Commodore. You know, saying, you know what, Kirk, you were right. You know, I'm a schmuck. 
and I love you. I respect <laughs> you. You are the man. This is why I'm wearing a red shirt, and this is why you're wearing a gold shirt. Yeah, and there's McCoy all yep. uh, looking uh, you know, all young and fresh again. Scotty's fine, according to McCoy. And everything's good again. Yeah. Everything is good again. And, yeah, well, uh, Spock's still got to get his treatment. Well, McCoy has prepared a potent, potent shot for Spock, and he's removed all breakable items from sick pay, so that Spock won't uh, be able to break anything on his violent reaction to this shot. Yeah. So, uh, as we're closing out, I, I want to say to the listening audience out there, if you are watching along with us, I want you to keep an eye on the credits for this episode. There's a still shot of a, uh, a Tellarite in test makeup. Oh, cool. During this credit sequence against a red curtain backdrop. It looks a little bit different than the Tellarites that we saw in Journey to Babel. So kind of unknown as to why they would include that in the credit sequence, but it is definitely in there. Uh, really a uh, cool thing to see if you just keep your eyes peeled uh, as these credits are rolling. Yeah, I'm going to look for that now instead of Here it talking. comes. It's coming up, I think, right after this, um, this, uh, uh, this scene with his jail cells. There it is. Oh, wow, yeah. There he is. He's got like ho- these weird furry hooves for hands, yeah. and the eyes don't look right. Uh, but there you go. Neat. So pretty neat. They, they kind of shoehorn that in there. Mm-hmm. So, Jeff, let me tell you that based on our discussions during this episode, I changed my vote. Get out. Yeah. Get I, out. Was, I was going to vote um, non-essential, um, but – during our discussion, you pointed out some really, really important things. Mm-hmm. Um, notably, um, the two things we learned about the Romulans. There you go. And then I, I guess also, um, to a lesser extent, the uh, little signature pad that that Kirk was signing off on. So um, I, I think um, just taking the you know the Romulan aspect of this episode, um, you know, and factoring that into the equation. Um, I think, for me at least, there's enough to uh, to make me think this is a essential viewing. All right, so I I, I think that you probably figured out that I was going to go essential on this, but I'm going to go essential for a, quite a few different reasons, and I'll list them all out. Number one is uh, well, I I, I don't want to rank this. I don't want to say this one's number one or more important than another, but uh, you got a couple of different timestamps in this episode number one uh you got the number of years that sulu has served under kirk Kirk sulu says that he served under kirk for two years so you get a little timestamp there you also got kirk's actual age 34 years old right so you know around about how old kirk is through the original series and you've got a past relationship of kirk's with a timestamp on it you know, Kirk's Kirk was dating or had a relationship with this doctor at six uh, years and four months ago. So you know exactly when Kirk was involved with this person. You've got a frame of reference time-wise, uh, which a lot of times we don't get. We usually get kind of, oh, yeah, we were involved. And, you know, think of back to um, uh, what, what, what's the conscience of the king where you've got Kodos – they never really say how far in the past Kirk was on that planet and experienced that genocide, right? It was kind of a roundabout thing. But now you're you're getting these explicit uh, times that are put out there. So that that alone, I think, is great anchor point for anybody who's trying to learn more about the original series. Mm-hmm. You also have the statements about the Romulans. We don't see a heck of a lot of Romulans in the original series, but in this episode, we don't actually see them, but we learn things about them. Very yeah. cool. And a selfish moment here for me is I love the Kirk hero moment at the end. That is one of my favorite Kirk hero moments in an episode that's really kind of hokey in a way. You've got this moment where all appears to be lost and Kirk just barges right onto the bridge and saves the effing day 
without even batting an eye like he's smirking the whole time like oh this is nothing man yeah i can take care of this i'm not even worried and nobody else is worried (laughs) they're looking at him like oh kirk's here we're fine yeah i that's great it shows the confidence of the crew in kirk and it's amazing uh, you know, even to a lesser extent, you've got the the, the scenes where Kirk is being uh, he's on trial, quote unquote, and then the rest of the crew is defending him. There's a lot of great stuff in this episode, despite the fact that it's the quote unquote everybody gets old episode yeah. that happens so many times is a trope that we've seen used. I think that it's essential for a lot of different reasons. So uh, very obvious essential vote for me. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. All right. So that brings us to the end of yet another episode of the Tricorder Transmissions. We will be back again next Sunday with another regularly scheduled episode. If you want to hit us up on social media, in the meantime, we are are available on Facebook.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions and Twitter at TTT underscore pod and our own website www.thetricordertransmissions.com Please yeah. uh, jump on over and like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. We would love to hear from you. Yeah, I know. Um, I look forward to seeing those posts um, either on Sunday, Monday, or maybe even Tuesday from uh, from our listener, Matt. Um, he normally has a pretty good analysis of the episode we've just talked about. So uh, um, really enjoy reading those, Matt. Um, and uh, uh, your your insight into the series is always uh, is always interesting to uh, to read. Yeah, absolutely, I agree, Matt. Thanks a lot for your past contributions, and we hope we hear from you again in the near future. So next Sunday we will be back with one of my I'll tip my hand now one of my favorite episodes, Obsession. Ah, okay. All right, so we'll see you all then. Thanks, of course, for listening. Interesting parallel. I remember that while shooting The Deadly Years with its end-of-life theme, we were also hearing much gossip about the impending demise of the series. According to the rumor mill, The Deadly Years could very well have been our last episode. But, as television history would have it, we were saved yet again by the series' devotees who exercised their ingenuity. A woman named B. Jo Trimble became known as the fan who saved Star Trek through her clever plan of obtaining the mailing lists of the World Science Fiction Convention and sci-fi booksellers. She urged all those people on the lists to put pen to paper and write letters expressing their dismay at the possible cancellation of the series. As a result, NBC was inundated with towering piles of viewer mail and decided to renew the series for another season thanks to B. Joe and what's perhaps known as one of the most successful chain letters ever.